Good morning. My name is Jacob Hunter, and I am the pastor at Industry United Methodist Church, and I welcome you to worship this August 9th, 2020. I welcome you on behalf of our congregation, and I hope that this is a meaningful and enjoyable time of worship for you. Our first song this morning is going to be Give Me Oil for My Lamp, sung by Mark and Leslie Johnson. As we continue this morning in worship, will you join me in the opening prayer? Let us pray. Lord, we come to you this day in the midst of our summer months. For many, this is a time of relaxation, but for others, the burdens, worries, and cares continue to weigh them down. Be with each of us as we open our ears to hear your words, our hearts to feel your presence, and our spirits to receive your healing touch. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I now invite you to take a couple of minutes to center your hearts and minds as we hear our centering song, Sanctuary. Will you join me now in the prayer for illumination? Let us pray. Nurturing God, we are hungry for good news. Let the heavenly food of Scripture nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. This morning, reading our Scripture, we have Terry Godwin. Here she is. Our Scripture lesson this morning comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21, and this is where Jesus feeds the 5,000. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. 
Bring them here to me, he said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up the twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Terry, for reading our scripture. So this morning's scripture is one that not only is a well-known passage amongst many Christians, it's also the only passage that is found in all four Gospels in the Bible. It's the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And, and before we get even started, I just want to say that that's what it's called. But in reality, it's really the feeding of the 15,000, possibly 20,000. There's 5,000 men and then women and children as well. And we have no idea how many there are. But we do know that there were 5,000 men. And it's an amazing story, no matter how you look at it. So this passage that we, he we have here this morning actually takes place after a pretty horrific passage that for some reason the lectionary skips over and, and sometimes I think it's okay and sometimes I think it's one we should talk about. But the passage that precedes this immediately is the murder, the beheading of John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. And so when this passage starts, it starts by saying that Jesus is now getting into a boat and withdrawing to a private place. He is doing this partly because he wants to grieve and mourn the loss of his cousin, but also probably a little bit to not be around where Herod is, the man who just killed his cousin. And so Jesus is trying to withdraw to a secluded place. And what happens? Well, the people in the towns around hear what happened and hear that Jesus is leaving to go to a different place, and so they follow him. They follow him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus is going to try to be alone, to try to spend time with God, and to just be. And Jesus is followed. Now, I want to talk first about the feeding of the 5,000. That is an important story. We know it's important because all four gospel writers put it into their story. This story is powerful and it's important. And so I want to talk briefly about it. The thing that I want to talk about is not quite exactly what is normally talked about. The miracle that Jesus takes five loaves of bread and two fish and gives thanks to God and, and, and then gives that to the disciples and 5,000, 10,000 people eat, and not only do they all eat from that, but there's leftovers. What I want to talk about is the disciples. You see, Jesus is with these folks, and it's starting to get late. And the disciples know that all they have is five loaves of bread and two fish. So they go to Jesus and they say, hey, Jesus, you should probably, it's late, it's past dinner time. You should probably send them off on their way so they could go to the villages and buy their own food because they need to do that. They need to eat as well. Which, if you think about it, it's kind of ridiculous. They're out in the middle of nowhere. And what city in that part of the world in that time is going to be able to accommodate over 5,000 people with food? There are very few. Maybe Jerusalem at best. And so the disciples are fearful. They, they are afraid they don't have enough. And so they go to Jesus and Jesus says, I'm not sending them away. They don't need to leave. You feed them. Don't send them for food. And the disciples say, Jesus, we don't have anything but five loaves of bread and two fishes. And so Jesus says, bring them to me. So Jesus gets the loaves and the fish, and he gives thanks to God. He lifts up that stuff, something that we will see repeated later on in the upper room. Jesus giving thanks to God and breaking bread. He does that. And then he gives it to the disciples, 
instead of doing it himself, and says to the disciples, feed them. You see, Jesus, he, he gives them the opportunity to see what he's been talking about for the last few chapters. See, the beginning of this chapter and the last chapter we've been reading for the last few weeks, which are the, the kingdom of heaven is like. Jesus just telling the disciples over and over, the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. And so he's giving them all of these examples about what the kingdom of heaven is like, what it's like to be in the presence of God and just be loved. Now he's giving them a chance to experience the kingdom of heaven. He's not only giving them a chance, but he's giving them the opportunity to be the ones who bring the kingdom of heaven to these people who are in desperate need of food. The disciples take what Jesus has blessed and they start feeding the multitude of people. They are now being the kingdom of heaven for these people. Jesus takes them from stories of what the kingdom of heaven is like and examples to now they are the example for others. The kingdom of heaven is like a group of people who feed those who are desperately in need. There are stories all around our country right now where we see lines sometimes hours long for people who are in desperate need of food because they've lost their job. We, even here at this church, help sponsor with other churches in the community the WECO food program. I was here the last time we did it, and what a, glory, what a great thing it is to be able to receive food and be able to give it to those who are in need. What an amazing opportunity to show others what the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like helping those in need. Now, when we talk about this passage, quite often we talk about the feeding of the 5,000 and the miraculous thing that Jesus did with the bread and the fish, and I don't want to discount that at all. But as I was reading this passage this week in preparation, there was something that jumped out at me, something that just spoke to me very powerfully. It's what happens before the feeding of the 5,000, before the disciples even come to Jesus. You see, at the beginning of this, I said that this is immediately following the murder of John the Baptist. Jesus has just learned that his cousin has been murdered and been beheaded and buried. Jesus hears this news, and as I think about it, if I were to hear that news, I would want time to myself. I would definitely need time to grieve and not be around a whole bunch of folks. And so the passage says he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And here's where the interesting part is. When he went ashore, he saw the great crowd. He had compassion for them, and he cured their sick. See, most likely these are homeless folks, or folks who are barely making it, folks who are sick because of starvation and lack of food in that time. The people that were out there didn't have a whole lot of money. And so Jesus, wanting to grieve his cousin's death, sees these people, and he stops what he's doing. He stops what he's going to go do, and he goes to the people. It says that he has compassion for them. His heart goes out to them. He has something that they need, the ability to heal them, to be with them, to give them hope. His heart goes out to them. He has compassion how often do we see people who are hurting and in need? And when we do, do we stop and talk to them? Do we stop and take care of them and help them and give them what they need? Or do we just say, I feel bad for that person? 
This past Tuesday evening in our Zoom Bible study, we talked about the difference between compassion and pity. We talked about the idea that pity is when you feel bad for someone, but you really don't do much about it. You just feel bad for them. And that compassion, like the compassion Jesus has here, like the compassion that the Good Samaritan had to stop and help the person that was injured, that compassion is a love for others, a love that goes beyond anything else, a compassion for helping those. Your heart goes out to them. You don't just feel bad for them and do nothing. You stop what you're doing, and you help those folks. Now, quite often, we, and when I say that, I include me, we see someone or we know that there's someone who needs help. And instead of having that compassion like Jesus and the Good Samaritan had, we have pity for them. We just say a quick prayer for them, or we say, man, I wish I could help that person, and move on. Jesus is trying to grieve the loss of his cousin, but he sees people who are in desperate need of help, and he stops, and he is with them. He just is with them as well. He doesn't ask for anything. He just is with them and amongst them. That compassion is an amazing thing. Earlier this week, I was talking to someone here at the church, and they said something to me that at the time really didn't sink in until I put it in the context of this. This person said to me, I do a lot of talking to God. Sometimes I wonder if He even listens. Because I do so much talking, he probably gets tired of hearing me talk to him and pray to him. At the time, I told that person, that's what God does. That's God's job. And, and I'm not changing that. That's what God does. God does listen to us. God stops what God is doing and is there when we pray to them. Jesus is God on earth. Jesus comes to set the example and show us what God is really like. Jesus had some other stuff he wanted to be doing. And he saw people who were in need. People came to him and said, we need your help. And he stopped everything else he was doing. And he was there for each and every one of those people. After my conversation, I wish that I could go back to that conversation and say, here's an example of how God stops everything and is there for you when you need him. I truly believe that's the message this morning. I believe that the message is a message of hope for us, that when we have doubts that God is even there, or when we feel like we have nothing else, a hope and reminder that God is always there. God will always stop and pay attention to us, be there for us, and wrap us in hope, faith, and love. Now I think if that's the example that we see from Jesus of what God does for us. Jesus came to teach the disciples and teach those around what it is to be a true follower. So if Jesus does those things, he expects it from us as well. Now I'm, I'm not saying that every time you see someone who's in need or someone comes to you in a time of need, that you have to stop everything and help them. But the encouragement I have for you and for myself is that especially in this time, 
this time of not only folks around us, folks around the country and folks around the world who are just hurting, who are suffering and in pain and just need somebody. And they might have even lost all faith that God is there because they don't have that, this story in front of them this week. The encouragement I have for all of us is that we need to be more like God and more like Jesus. We need, when we see folks like that, not to just have pity on them, but to have true compassion and love for them and to help them the best we are able. I think about things like this from time to time, and I think what a better world we would be in if we all just helped each other and loved each other the best way we can following the examples of Jesus. And my other hope and prayer is that you never forget in your time of need that God always has compassion for you as well. And you can always reach out to God and know that he's listening. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is Faith of Our Fathers, sung by members of our industry, United Methodist Church Choir. come to that time in our worship service in which we stop and we give God the joys and concerns that are on our hearts and minds so that we know they are heard. This morning they'll be done, we'll do it just a little bit different though. I will share a few joys and concerns of our congregation and then I will start the pastoral prayer. There'll be a time in the pastoral prayer where we'll pause and you will have a moment to lift up the joys and concerns on your hearts and minds and then we will close with the Lord's Prayer. This morning, we lift up all of the folks in our congregation who are healing from injuries and from surgeries and those who will be having surgery this week upcoming. We pray for their healing and loving touch of God as they recover. We also lift up all of those around the country and the world who are suffering from COVID-19. Uh, we pray for them as they heal and recover. We lift up the family members who have lost loved ones, and we lift up the friends who suffer with the folks that they love. We just continue to lift up all those folks. We also not only pray for our city, but for our county, our state, our, 
our, just our whole world. We pray for everyone, including and especially the leadership, who have to make tough decisions and are continually faced with things that we can't even imagine. We just pray for their leadership and guidance from God as they move forward. Let us go to God in prayer. As the crowds follow Jesus eager to be filled with hope, we come this day to this place seeking nourishment for our souls. We hunger and thirst for the word of hope and truth, but our lives are battered by anger and hostility. Our hearts are filled with concerns for family and friends, for our country and for our world. We don't see how we can be of help to others. Sit us down as Jesus seated the multitude. Calm us down as Jesus reassured the disciples that all would receive food. Lift us up as Jesus encouraged others to reach out in compassion. Give us hearts of confident faith in your presence, O Lord. Place your hands of healing on the many situations which we name at this time with our voices and in our hearts. Lord, we ask your merciful goodness for those situations of these loved ones. It is in Jesus' name that we pray the prayer that he taught his disciples and us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our final song this morning is He Reigns. Here once again are Mark and Leslie Johnson. It's a song of the
As we conclude our time together this morning, I'd like to thank all of those who helped make this worship service possible. I'd like to also thank all of you out there who have continued to pray for us and also continue to support this congregation uh, through this unprecedented time. Our hope and prayer is that in the near future, very soon, hopefully, we'll be able to gather once again together. As soon as we have made the decision that that is going to happen, we will be sure to let everyone know as fast and as soon as possible. But as we leave today, please hear this benediction that was written by Blair Money. As you leave this place, may the living Lord go with you. May he go behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, beneath you to lift you from your sorrows, within you to give you the gifts of faith, hope, and love, and always before you to show you the way. Amen. We'll see you next week.